So some pro days have been going on, and Daniel Jeremiah has come out with an updated top 50 NFL prospects list. I thought it'd be a good thing to look at as we approach the draft. We are now in April as I record and post this. So we are counting down the days just a couple of weeks away. I need to finalize my prospect rankings. I'm running a little bit behind on that. And I need to post my top, I'll probably do, I don't know, 50 just feels like not enough. I might do a top 100 big board this year because I've really been like fully invested in a lot of the prospects. So uh, I think I can get 100 out. And uh, I've looked at like a, like 150 or 200 so far this year in the past like four or five months. So uh, I think I should be able to uh, put that together. So hit that subscribe button if you're excited for that content. I know this is not mine. We're just looking at something that Daniel Jeremiah did, who's extremely respected uh, from my perspective. So uh, we're going to be looking at that. There are some changes. I have already looked at this a couple days ago when it came out. This was posted on the 29th. It is now the 1st of April. And... It, there are some interesting changes. Kyle Pitts has moved up to his second overall player in the draft. And that moved Jamar Chase down one spot. Some pro days happened and Jamar Chase ran really well. He's an interesting player to watch because he doesn't really seem that fast as a route runner. He doesn't seem like particularly sudden. But when he has the football in his hands, he has that unreal next gear that he gets up to. But also sometimes you see him stack corners. And in order to do that off press, you got to be pretty sudden. So it, it, it's super weird. Sometimes he has it, sometimes he doesn't. Um, but he's really, really good overall. But he did move down from Kyle Pitts, who might be the best overall receiver in the draft. I know we all want to say versatile weapon. I still have Jalen Waddle as receiver one, but Kyle Pitts is a dominant prospect. And because of his versatility we talk about, Kyle Pitts probably is going to end up being my second best player in the draft as well. I have Zach Wilson near the top of the draft as well. Uh, he's number four for Daniel Jeremiah. I would probably put him at either two or four because Kyle Pitts and I think Jalen Waddle are going to be sandwiched next to each other. Uh, Chase is going to follow somewhere very close for me. Waddle moves up to number five. Devontae Smith moved up to number six. Now, he didn't really do much. He didn't um, get weighed or anything at his pro day. Uh, still just going with his playing weight, which is probably for the best because, like, there are durability concerns with someone who plays at his size, which is reported to be, like, 170 pounds. So, for someone that is, like, six foot one, 170 pounds, and even playing weight at, like, under 170 for times at Alabama, there are going to be questions and concerns about that, but the tape doesn't lie. He's unbelievable. He moves up two spots for DJ. Trey Lance moves up four spots, as does Justin Fields. He still has Lance as QB3 and Justin Fields as QB4, which is also the way I have it. I don't want to echo everything that Daniel Jeremiah says, but I've come to these uh, conclusions on my own accord based off tape study. I posted an entire video on ranking the top 10 quarterbacks in the class, according to my opinion. So if you guys want to check that out, feel more than free to. The running backs video is out as well. Receivers will be following very shortly. I just want to do the finishing touches on that because I don't exactly have my order. It's very close. There's so many good receivers. I'm probably going to end up doing a top 15 on that video because there just are so many great guys that I really want to talk about. But Fields is unbelievable as well. As I talked about on that quarterback video, it seems disrespectful to label anyone quarterback three or quarterback four because these top four quarterbacks has such unbelievable t uh, potential and they're really, really good coming out of college that you don't want to label a guy like Justin Fields QB4 because he could easily be QB2. I think three years down the line, he could be quarterback one. And you could say that about any of these top four guys. Like Trevor Lawrence is the best day one quarterback and he could be the best, you know, day 1000 quarterback, you know, two and a half, three years in the future. Um, but like it's so close these guys are all so good and when you talk about like growing as a player these guys could be neck and neck in a few years time i think all of them have top 10 potential in the league for quarterback so we're getting some really talented players coming to the draft rashawn slater as ot1 he moves down a couple spots though to nine patrick sertan moves up to four he ran pretty well uh, faster than expected which does boost his stock a little bit, you might you might say. Micah Parsons moved down one spot. We talked about some potential off-the-field issues with him. Um, overall, with Micah, he's got just unreal athleticism that's going to propel him up a lot of draft boards, probably. Even if his instincts as a linebacker aren't exactly top tier, he gets redirected fairly regularly. He gets kind of lost in the action, but 
The athleticism is about as high as you'd ever see from anyone playing his position. So, from a guy that shows you the splash plays, if you can clear him from a character perspective, yeah, he's going to be near a top 10 player in the draft. Panay Sewell falls to 12. Uh, still a really interesting prospect. Sewell could very easily be offensive tackle one, depending on how you feel about him um, right now versus three years in the future. If you get an, like a, a good offensive line coach to coach Sewell up and, and get him uh, fundamentally more sound and, you know, kind of change some technique issues that he has, like his uh, upper half getting over the top of his lower half, uh, in front, it's it's not great on that. He gets off balance, but then he makes up for getting off balance with such great athletic ability and such great functional strength. Sewell's really weird. You could sell me on him being a top five player in the draft as well as someone down here because his potential sky high, but sometimes the tape isn't super clean, especially in a passing offense like Oregon has. It gets the football out quickly. It wasn't really required to hold blocks for an extended amount of time. But Sewell's still really good. I still don't understand Gregory Rousseau at number 13. He's just, we say raw all the time, but I'm not sure that his athletic ceiling is anything crazy. He moves pretty well in space, but he's not sudden or explosive. Uh, his hands are solid. He's really just going to be probably an edge setting defensive end that really doesn't get a ton of pressure off the edge. His pressure comes uh, on like obvious passing downs where he can move inside and take advantage of offensive guards and maybe even the center. He's lined up over the nose before, um, or on the nose over the center before. So Rousseau to me at 13 doesn't make very much sense. There is a guy I want to talk about that I probably will mention in the edge video in Jordan Smith out of UAB, who's also about six foot seven, although he's only about 255 pounds. Jordan Smith from UAB is what people think Gregory Rousseau is to me, just a freak athlete with extreme size, but who is super raw. To me, Rousseau, is just really big and he isn't quite like explosive or athletic enough to warrant a guy being inside the top 15 who's also still raw and inexperienced as a pass rusher so Rousseau does have good potential because of that size and strength and overall athleticism even if he lacks explosiveness and speed to me it's 13 is just a little bit high quitty pay at 14 moves up five spots pay is still really good i think there's a good chance he could be edge two in the class i still have jalen phillips as number one he's just unbelievable some red flags with him from a medical perspective but quitty pay is also really really good as well you could sell me on edge two for him he moves up into the top 15 and then rounding out the top 15 we have elijah vera tucker who's just a really solid guard with tackle flexibility he's pretty much going to be solid in any offensive line position you put him at he's just a really really good fundamentally technical sound player on the interior of an offensive line. Vera Tucker's just really good. Number 16 is JC Horn. He moves up a lot. And with Caleb Farley having a potential red flag due to medical with another back surgery, JC Horn, who tested unbelievably well, showed up huge and still tested really well. Uh, kind of like a Darrell Rebus type pro day performance where he was built really, really solid, but also had that explosiveness and that unbelievable speed. And JC Horn's just a dog, man. He's just aggressive at corner a little handsy which we've talked about from time to time but that's something you can clean up jc horn is a really really good player and once he tested so well athletically he was bound to move up and he's in the conversation for the first corner off the board he really is horn is a really really intriguing player and i think top 16 is is well warranted we just talked about Caleb Farley moving down a little bit. He moves down 12 spots, though. Still a really, really good player. His athleticism carries him, but he's still really solid in coverage. The big thing with him is the medical red flags, where he probably will end up falling down the board a little bit. Still a really, really good player. And if he is healthy, which we don't know if he's going to be, or if this is going to be a nagging injury for the rest of his career, hopefully this doesn't derail his career, but if he stays healthy which is a big if, but if he does, he's going to be the steal of the draft for whatever team grabs him. Jeremiah Wusu koromoa at number 18. Hearing that he is consensus linebacker one, although I view him as potential uh, safety, I think he is an overhang defender, best case scenario, which is someone that is going to play almost like a slot cornerback role in that overhang spot, like over the slot receiver uh, is where that kind of lines up near the line of scrimmage. Owusu Koromoa has played at about 210 pounds, which is pretty light for a linebacker. I really don't think he's going to be a Mike. 
I don't think he's going to play on the inside. I think his best case scenario at linebackers playing weak side at the will. Still really like him. He's the best cover linebacker in the draft. And, and top 20 seems fair as well. Trayvon Merrick, number one safety in the class. I, I don't accept or I don't have any exception to this. I think this is extremely fair. I like Richie Grant probably just as much, maybe even a little bit more, just because I think Richie Grant is uh, someone that can play a hybrid corner role more than Trayvon Merrick could, but he is a really, really solid safety. And uh, again, top 20 feels fair. He falls uh, three spots. I probably have Merrick a little farther down the board, maybe about, about 10 spots or so. We'll have to see how that ends up being finalized. Travis Etienne and Najee Harris at 20 and 21. This is an interesting conversation we talked about running back uh, all year, but who would have guessed that Javante Williams would move so far up uh, the board? Once I watched him, I was completely sold. I think Etienne, Najee Harris, and wherever Javante Williams happens to be, 26. He moved up six spots. Um, they're about RB1, RB2, RB3 um, in any particular order. I think it's 1A, 1C, 1B. I said that in a super weird order, but... Um, like, these running backs are all super close. Jalen Phillips moved down a couple of spots to 22. I guess, along with Caleb Farley, the injury stuff is being factored in because otherwise Jalen Phillips is about a top 10 player in the class. He is very, very, very good. And if he's a guy that stays healthy and on the field, I mean, again, another probable unbelievable steal. He has the athleticism to play either 3-4 outside linebacker, but I like his best fit in a 4-3 as a defensive end. Kadarius Tony at 23. Tony's really good. He is my receiver five, probably. I like Rashad Bateman a lot more. And as you'll see, Rashad Bateman is pretty far down the uh, down the board for Jeremiah. I just, I like Rashad Bateman a lot. He's a really good route runner with good size and pretty good physicality with the football in the air. The only real problem with him is his ability after the catch. There really isn't a whole lot there, or at least there wasn't at Minnesota. And sometimes he could struggle to beat press, but he's an outside guy. Kadarius Toney is probably more of a primary slot. I think he can play on the outside as well. I like Elijah Moore a lot too, who I think is on this list. I haven't seen this in a couple days, but Elijah Moore is really a primary slot and only a slot, slot only. But I think Kadarius Toney could play on the outside. Now, I thought this was Jameen for a while, but now I'm hearing it's like Jamin Davis, which is fine. He moves up a lot to 24, 11 spots. And there's a lot to like with him. He's pretty good in zone coverage, which is uh, obviously a trait of a linebacker that you're really, really looking for. Reads quarterbacks very well, and he's a great athlete um, and physical as a linebacker as well. So I'm, I'm really happy to see him getting some more love. I know DJ's been on this train for a while. Zayvon Collins is 25, and this one is an interesting one. I was talking to Brett Coleman about this, and I teased this on Twitter, and then I joked that it was an April Fool's. Uh, but Brett Coleman and I are going to be doing a joint mock draft. He came to me and said that'd be a pretty good idea for a video, and I agreed. But we talked about Zayvon Collins, and that the big issue with him is based on the way he played at Tulsa and Tulsa's defense, really that his brain's going to have to be rewired because the way he looks at the game is going to have to be completely different in a pro-style defense opposed to what he was actually doing at Tulsa. He's good in zone coverage. He's a great athlete, and he's super, super big, but he's going to have to rework the way uh, he approaches an opposing offense just because like, it's a completely different style, and his tasks that he was tasked with at Tulsa were completely different to what he's probably going to be asked to do in the NFL. So if a coach wants to take on that responsibility, he's going to be a great player, great pickup. But uh seems like maybe some coaches won't want to do that, as crazy as that sounds. it's Someone wouldn't want to take on the task, and they'd want a guy that can fit into their scheme right away. Uh, Jalen Mayfield is at 27. We talked about Javante Williams a little bit. He drops two spots, still one of the top offensive tackles in the class, especially in a power run scheme. Greg Newsom moves up a couple spots, number uh, 28. I like Newsom a lot. I think he's probably going to end up being ranked even higher on this list for me. Uh, I do like the corners quite a lot in this class. I think all of them are, or not all of them, but I think a lot of them are day one, ready to go upgrades at corner for a lot of teams. I think when you talk about some of the top corners in this class, I think what could be considered a first round player or what can, can, can be considered to be like 
a top 32 player in the draft. You talk about Greg Newsom, J.C. Horn, Patrick Sertan, Caleb Farley. I like Eric Stokes quite a bit. And then you bring in some of these other kind of like fringe first round guys and Aaron Robinson, Tay Gowan, maybe uh, both out of UCF. You talk about so many of these different corner prospects that are fringe first round guys that could sneak in. I think Newsom's a little bit better than a lot of those guys. So he might be CB4 in the draft, CB5, and probably about a top 25 player. I think that's a fair ranking. Aziz Ojolari moves up 10 spots to 29. Uh, I don't really see it with Ojolari. Like, he's got good hands. He's pretty good off the edge. He takes good angles to the quarterback, but he's not particularly bendy. I think you're getting a day one pretty good player with not a super high ceiling. I think Ojolari has good potential in the right scheme. I think he's got to be a 3-4 outside linebacker with his size. Um, but he's got he's got no bend. I mean, he's like, he's as stiff as a board. And that can be a problem when you talk about ceiling as an edge rusher. Might be able to develop in that way, but that's usually something that you either have or you don't. And he's just not particularly bendy. Levi Anzarike in here at 30. Got a chance to watch him a little bit. Uh, one of the true solid pass rushing defensive tackles in the class. I think I probably like Christian Barmore as D-tackle one. He just turned it on um, through the last stretch of games for Bama. And he also offers a ton of pass rush with better size than Levi Anzarike. But Levi Anzarike has it on tape. Pretty good player. Jason Owe at number 31. Freak athlete. I think he gets bumped up a lot because of that. Um, was decent at pressuring the quarterback despite having zero sacks all time or not all time but last season at Penn State I don't think he's this good I don't think he's a top 31 player in the draft um, right now with his athletic traits his ceiling definitely grows but top 31 is a little bit too high for me Matt Jones into the top 32 he moves up two spots I think this is about where he is uh, might go a lot higher probably will just because of teams that are really going to want a quarterback but to me mac jones isn't anything special but is a good player that definitely could be effective given the right system and weapons nick bolton moves down four spots nick bolton's good i think his lack of ability in zone coverage kind of scares me a little bit um i think he's like cameron mcgrone in a lot of ways except just a little worse so even though Cameron McGrone has some injury red flags, a linebacker from Michigan, McGrone is just a better player, in my opinion. So if you're going to go after a guy that's not particularly great in zone coverage, to me, like, McGrone is better than Bolton. Bolton's probably not a top 33 player in the draft. I probably have him uh, down the board a lot. Tevin Jenkins at 34 moves down four spots. He should be moving up. Tevin Jenkins tested really, really well, and his tape's really, really good. Um... Just strong, mean on the offensive line. What's not to like with Tevin Jenkins? He should be higher. Joe Tryon moves down eight spots. I watched him. He's just pretty much got like prototypical size. And I think that moves him up a lot. In the same way that guys like Jason Owe, I think they probably like Joe Tryon. Um, I'm not really a huge fan of his. I don't think he's ranked top 35 uh, really or even close. I think he's a borderline top 50 player, but... To me, he's not really uh, near a round one guy right now, so I wouldn't have him near this high. Darasaw moves down 10 spots. Again, I like these offensive tackles. I think Darasaw is much higher than th uh, 36. Really, really like him as a player. I think he's probable top 20, and moving down 10 spots is wild. I'm kind of confused as to why that happened. There's no real explanation. Terrace Marshall moves up three spots. The receiver class is, is really, really good. Um, Terrace Marshall's solid. He's a big-time receiver. And Elijah Moore moves up 12 spots. Love Elijah Moore. He is a really good route runner with top-end speed. Again, he's probable slot only, and that moves him down a little bit. But he is just a freak with the ball as well. Uh, Elijah Moore is, is a big-time threat in the slot for sure, I think, immediately. Asante Samuel Jr. moves into the top 40. Nice to see this. Didn't mention him earlier because I knew we'd get to him later, but he's another fringe first-round guy that very well could go first round for a lot of reasons. He's probably going to be a slot guy right away, but I think he does have the technique and ability to play on the outside despite not being prototypical size. I like Asante J Samuel Jr. quite a lot. And, of course, the bloodlines are there with Asante Samuel. Uh, Landon Dickerson moves down three spots. 
Still probably the best center in the class. Creed Humphrey is pretty comparable and pretty close. Dickerson's got more prototypical size, which we've said so many times about players so far uh, in this rankings. But Creed Humphrey might be a little bit of a better player. Uh, it's very close. I'd probably still give Dickerson the edge and the size puts him on top. Uh, Eichenberg moving up six spots, 241. I think this is a pretty good ranking for him. He is a solid player. Barmore moves down one spot. And uh, I think w with Christian Barmore, uh, you just really love his size and potential. It's tough to get a player as big and athletic as he is um, with still being a pretty technically sound player on the interior. Solid run stuffer, but actually offers ability to get after the QB as well. Barmore is a, is a player I like a lot for the future. Ronnie Perkins is still a player that... You know, I see him and he does everything pretty well. I don't think he does anything particularly amazing. So I guess, you know, about 43 is a pretty good spot for him. Uh, I think he's a fringe first round guy. But with Ronnie Perkins, to me, you're getting a player that I don't think is ever going to be elite, but should be a really good player right away. Uh, Quinn Miners into the top 50. Love this. He was great at the Senior Bowl. His tape is dominant but he was also at Wisconsin Whitewater, so he's not going up against anyone particularly good. No disrespect to those guys, but I will be disrespectful. He played, what is that, like D3? But he was really, really, really good at Wisconsin Whitewater. And the Senior Bowl was super telling that put Quinn Miners on the map as one of the top offensive linemen on the interior in the class. Whether that's a center or guard, Quinn Miners could be a very, very good player. Kelvin Joseph at 45. After his pro day, would have expected to see him move up a little bit. He ran like 4-3-5, and it's already there on tape. He is a uh, physical, and he is uh, a player with boomer and bust potential at cornerback, but is solid in zone coverage as well. Like, Calvin Joseph, there's a lot to like with him. Pat Fryermuth into the top 50, or I guess he was at 49 previously. He moves up three spots. He's pretty good. Um, I don't love Pat Fryermuth. I don't think the athleticism is there the way... Um, you maybe would like to see. Like, obviously, it's not a fair comparison with Mike Kosicki coming out of Penn State, as Kosicki's just a freak athlete. And I think all the tight ends are kind of being weighed down in this class because of Kyle Pitts. But Fryermuth is good, if not great. Should be a pretty good player right away. But I don't see anything particularly special with him. I like Brevin Jordan probably a little bit more, even though he tested really poorly um, from a, a relative athletic perspective. But Fryermuth is good. I think top 50 is probably about right. Uh, Dylan Radon's moved down three spots. Radon's is good. Um, he's probably a fringe top 50 guy, so I think this makes sense. Rashad Bateman moves down two spots. I like him a lot more. I think he's a top 25 player in the class. Rashad Bateman, to me, is really, really good. I don't, I don't see him near uh, the bottom of the top 50. I think he's much better than that. Elijah Molden up into the top 50. I think that's definitely fair. Really, really good slot corner that can be a free safety at the next level as well. Has a really good feel for zone coverage. So uh, when you take a player like that, he has free safety written all over him. And he'd be athletic at the position as well. Uh, you talk about a guy that reminds me of Mika Fitzpatrick coming out of Alabama. Elijah Molden, I think, could do a lot of the same things. Although probably not as well. Uh, and then number 50 is Jabril Cox moving down seven spots. I hate to see this, man. He's one of the best zone cover linebackers in the draft. And we talked about how valuable that could be earlier. And Jabril Cox is really, really good in that way. Former North Dakota State guy as well, if I recall correctly. And uh, he's another guy that I think should be a second-round pick and will be an impact player right away. And another guy with a super high floor, in my opinion. As we see 2-2 Atwell dropping out. I talked about this in the last time. I think that's fair. I don't think Atwell's a top 50 guy. Davion Nixon drops out. Potential red flags with him. And then Aaron Robinson drops out. Although Aaron Robinson, I think, might be a little bit better than Elijah Molden. So uh, that one is a little bit peculiar to me. But overall, this was a very interesting update, as hopefully you guys are getting familiarized with the new additions into the top 50. Quinn Miners uh, was in there. Asante Samuel Jr. was in there as well. Elijah Moore is moving up a lot. So really interesting update, as we are just about three weeks away from the NFL Draft. I'm super excited, as usual. I appreciate Dan uh, Jeremiah for this updated Top 50. Hit that subscribe button if you're not subscribed already, and I will see you in the next one. Take it easy.
Deep as a joke, I'm laughing so loud. Speed burst good.